Backstage with Robert Emery. Hello and welcome to another episode of Backstage with me, Robert Emery. This is episode number nine, Classical Music is Dead, Long Live the Dead. I thought it was about time we had a chat about classical music and this is one of the every other time podcasts where I'm not interviewing somebody and I'm wittering on about a topic which for me is uh, really important. And classical music has been incredibly important in my life and will continue to do so. But I think it's in a seriously dangerous position right now and uh, we're on the edge of something happening. I'm not sure what that something is. It could be miraculous. Um, it could be disastrous. I honestly don't know. Um, but I thought it would be an interesting thing to talk about it. Um, but of course, what is classical music? I mean, that's such a broad phrase that uh, people use. And unfortunately, this is part of the problem. It's it's a branding issue because classical music is actually a misused term. It's Classical in itself is a, an art period from about 1750 to about 1820 that sort of encompasses music, visual arts, literature, architecture, um, and it's a specific period of music. Before that, we had uh, Baroque, uh, Renaissance music, and now technically we're in the sort of modern music is what it's called, or contemporary music. So classical music, in inverted commas, for a start, is a brand which the general public use to describe orchestral music and choral music but actually it's not classical music now does that make any difference is that really a valid point well i kind of think it is because i think there is a negative association with the brand of classical music i think there's a negative association with the word classical and i think people are scared of it i think people don't understand it and i think you can say the word classical and immediately they feel boredom um, which is a real shame because anybody who has experience in orchestral music or choral music can know how thrilling exciting and passionate it can be and yes of course there's some boring things out there like everything else in life but that doesn't necessarily mean the word classical has to be boring Um, Classical music has never been a mainstream music. And this is the interesting thing. Classical music is dead. Is it? Well, yes, it is. Because classical music, by very definition, is historical music, which was written in the classical period. And even if you broaden that um, explanation out to, to other periods of Baroque and Renaissance and other periods, then... Yes, you know, it is historic. It, it is dead. Um, but just by the technical nature that most of the composers are dead. But there are modern composers who are writing today who are very much alive. Would they call themselves classical musicians? I honestly don't know. I think you'd need to ask them. But what I do know is that for some reason, we feel that classical music should be formal. We, we've got this, we've got into a pattern where classical music in the concert hall is relatively formal. And and I, I have no idea how we've got there, but back in the day of when Mozart was writing, you know, they used to have accordion dances and singing and other forms of music rather than just a concerto or a symphony. And it was much less formal um, when Mozart used to go and give his 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 recitals of his music. He also used to improvise. Now, you get a lot of improvisation in jazz, but if you ask a classical music to, a musician to go on stage and improvise, you know, the majority of them are going to be very scared and reluctant to do so. And for some reason it seemed very much as um as a as a thing that you should not do now. And so classical music in inverted commas um has developed from being not a formal um thing but actually now is the formal music. But it's never been mainstream, because even in the day of Mozart, the mainstream music would have been, you know, the according dances or the singing in groups and the folk songs. That would have been the pop music of its day. So the idea that uh, classical music, music written by dead people, essentially, Um, was at one time the mainstream pop music and it has now diminished into what it is today is just wrong. There's no other way around it. People used to 
do things back in the day that were very different. And we have certain people to thank for that. Franz Liszt, for instance, he was a great pioneer. And he used to, um, well, before Franz Liszt decided that he didn't like this, uh, a piano recital, or in fact, piano recitals didn't even really exist then by themselves, but a concert with a piano, the pianist would always have their back to the audience. So the piano would face upstage if you're looking at it from an audience point of view. And it was Franz Liszt who turned around and said, well, this is rubbish. For a start, I want people to see my hands. I want people to be impressed by what I do. I want people to be able to see my face. I want people to hear the instrument better and and how the harpsichords and the forte pianos and the modern pianos are built with the, the lid that can throw out the sound to an audience. It makes sense to put it on a on a on an angle and so the audience can see that he was a real pioneer and Paganini he was a rock star of his day you know he had long hair he looked great he could play the violin like nobody before him he had this sort of superstar status and he was a showman he was the greatest showman of the day and so again we think about classical music and and, and old composers as stuffy boring Actually, a lot of the stories from these uh, guys uh, couldn't be further from the truth. And sadly, it was all guys, or mostly anyway. Um, and that's, uh, that's something which I'm going to bring up a little bit later. But today, we have our classical music rock stars still. There are people who are still trying to push out these old stuffy formalities. Um, and there are people who are lucky and catapulted onto a worldwide stage people like Sheku Kanin Mason, who was playing at the uh, wedding of Harry and Meghan. And of course, his profile, his career has shot through the roof, um, primarily because of that. But, you know, I hasten to add, if he didn't have the talent in the first place, he wouldn't be there. Um, Jess Gillum, uh, an amazing saxophonist. Um, and again, you wouldn't necessarily put saxophone as a classical instrument. Uh, you know, most people think of it as a jazz instrument, but she's really putting saxophone at the forefront of people's minds. And then you've got conductors like Dudamel who are just doing amazing things uh, with orchestras to try and um, break some of the stuff in us. And, and not everybody is as young as Sheku Kani Mason or Jazz Gillum. You've got somebody like Nigel Kennedy, who's been around for, well, all my life. And, and he's the bloke who goes and plays the violin uh, like a, a god wearing an Aston Villa t-shirt. Now, I slightly question his choice of football team, but aside from that, I love the fact that he um, is so confident and he is um, so accepted for who he is that he can do that. And unfortunately, though, that's not the norm. And, uh, and that's seen as something slightly strange. You know, I used to conduct concerts barefooted. Um, many of you know this, uh, and it happened purely by accident. I was wearing shoes. Well, I, in, a, in a rehearsal, I was um, hot and bothered, and, you know, I took my shoes and socks off like I normally do just to try and relax and keep cool in, in long rehearsals. And then for the gig, I put the shoes on, was about to walk onto a, onto a stage in Switzerland, actually, and uh, the promoter said, what on earth are you doing, Robert? And I looked at him and I said, well, I'm about to go on stage. And he said, yeah, but you're wearing shoes. Why are you wearing shoes? He said, you clearly love conducting barefooted because that's what you choose to do in all your rehearsals. So take them off, go on stage, be yourself and conduct barefooted. So I tried for years to do this and, and because I loved it. I love it because it just, it's how I'm at ease. Um, and also I'm a bit of a rebel and it sort of pushes the boundaries a bit and, and it just shows my slightly rebellious um, nature. And it's after so many um, people and promoters and other artists I work with saying that they didn't like it and they thought it was disrespectful to the concert hall and to the musicians, then, you know, I gave in and said, okay, fine. Do you know what? I'll, I'll forget that. I'll wear shoes. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to fight over that battle anymore. And, and sadly, that's what I've ended up doing, which, you know, I, I understand if I'm working with other artists, it may not be their main focus to have my um, ugly feet on the stage. And therefore, I kind of get it from their point of view as well. Um, but 
In the classical concert hall now, speaking to audiences is pretty much not the norm. Um, a spontaneous applause, especially in the middle of a piece or in the middle of a movement, is really seen as like the biggest frowned upon thing in the world. Um, and, you know, I, I think that in itself, those rules of concert etiquette just make things difficult. It makes it stuffy. And, and that's a real shame. You're not allowed to cough. I mean, I understand excessive coughing is is like annoying for anybody but hey you know you can probably hear I've got a bit of a sore throat today so you know I may cough we all cough it's kind of what we do as a human race sometimes and the idea that you have to cough and then you have 20 people staring at you like with a look of death how dare you do that in the middle of this beautiful piece of music is a bit sad really um I just think the stifling atmosphere of rules and and the appropriateness of all this. I, I think it's no wonder that people, especially youngsters, um, feel disinterested by classical music and, and feel it inaccessible and, and unwelcoming. So we go back to the fact that it is a male-dominated world. It has been for hundreds of years. Uh, why is that? I've, To be honest with you, I've got no idea. That's just part of the human race that has developed uh, 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 you know, with with, um, with musicians um, being male, it's a really tricky subject for me to talk about this because I am a white middle class male, <laughs> and um, and I find interesting enough with my career at the moment, I'm having quite a few meetings where I'm told, do you know what? We love you. We love the ideas that you've got, but you know, you're not suitable for us because you're a white middle class male. I'm find you know, I'm having an issue with that, uh, and that's something which I have to deal with. But you know, being a white middle class male means that I have a lot of options open to me, and maybe being a non-white, uh, non-middle class female makes it nigh on impossible to get into the world of classical music, which is a shame, and it's definitely something that um, we as a as a human race have to work on amongst many other things um but i do see breakthroughs coming through you know the 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 conductor of the cbso in birmingham phenomenal female young conductor um the conductor of uh, the chicago symphonetta phenomenal young female conductor Jess Gillum, she's the hot thing at the moment in terms of publicity, you know, phenomenal young female uh, saxophonist. Uh, Nicola Benedetti, um, uh, you know, phenomenal young female uh, violinist. So is it a commonplace now to have females in these positions and soloist positions and conductors and composers? No, absolutely not. It's, it's definitely not an equal balance. But I do see, slowly, things are um, starting to change in that world. I think where we have to be careful is where we have a real negative attitude towards males. Um, you know, I was at a conference, I was at a, a, a conference in Rotterdam two weeks ago called the Classical Next Conference. And there was a, a, a discussion um, about composers and a female composer who I actually don't know the name of, so I'm not scared to say this, um, but she stood up and she was talking about uh, a presentation that was happening to do with presenting some of the old works by Beethoven and Bach and Mozart and Brahms and some of these masters, presenting those in a new uh, an innovative way and that's what the presenter of this part of the conference was discussing doing and she stood up and her comment was um, why on earth are you only um, talking about dead white uh, males uh, why do we always have to listen and discuss classical music and talk to talk on topics for dead white males and I've got real mixed feelings about this. It's not Beethoven's fault. It's not Rachmaninoff's fault that they were white males. <laughs> um, you know, 
they're not here to defend themselves. They are superb masters of their art and the world would be a much poorer place without their music. So I don't think we should criticize that all of the uh, well-known composers that we are predominantly listening to now are dead white males. I, I don't see that as a negative thing. And I think the second we start seeing that element as a negative thing, we start getting bitter and twisted. And we all know what happens to bitter and twisted people. Um, so I think what we need to do is celebrate the female composers who are talented, who are writing today, and celebrate the female performers who are performing today. And we need to encourage that more. And I do see um, that happening on a slow basis. But I think trying to add a negative connotation into male dead composers, or even male performers who are alive, I think adding a negative connotation into that isn't particularly helpful right now. Classical music is listened to in a variety of media. Of course, people used to buy CDs. Now um, people stream music. Um, classical streaming still hasn't really taken off yet compared to uh, pop music. Um, and it's still in its infancy. Um, but one of the things that really has taken off um, like crazy is um, listening to classical music on the radio. Um, classical music on the radio actually began in Britain at uh, 10 past 7, I can read here, on June the 15th, 1920. And it was two years before the first ever BBC broadcast. And it was by a lady called Dame Nellie Melba, um, a female. Uh, and she was the first ever musician to give a live broadcast recital from the Marconi factory in Chelmsford in Essex. So that's where um, classical music started on the radio. And now by far the biggest classical radio station in the UK is Classic FM. Would you believe it? They have 5.3 million people tune in to Classic FM in the UK alone every week. 5.3 million. I think that's incredible. 52% female, 48% male. And last year alone they added 300 new, sorry, 300,000 new listeners with a 43% increase in under 25s. So how does that compare with um, a commercial radio station of the pop world? Well, 5.3 million is Classic FM. The UK's number one commercial radio brand is Heart FM, and they have 9.7 million listeners every week. So they have almost double um, what Classic FM have. I don't see that as a bad thing at all, because I think the idea of 5.3 million people listening to a classical radio station every week is absolutely fantastic. And I think Classic FM do a wonderful job. I'll praise them until the cows come home, um, because I, I think they are one of the driving forces of bringing classical music to younger people in the UK. I think that's a really great thing. Um, there is a new radio station for classical music, if you haven't heard about this. Um, the radio station is called Scala. And their tagline is classical music for modern life. Now, as I've talked about, the uh, word classical is misused and misrepresented and has a, a negative connotation to it. So I love Scala Radio. I've been listening to it a lot. Um, I think personally they took a while to bed down, but now they seem to have found their feet a little bit. Um, I do wonder, though, if they've missed a bit of a trick by using the word or by having to have the word classical in their tagline and not changing it to the word orchestral or something because a lot of the stuff they play, 70% of the music they play, is music that you will know and recognise from TV, film, radio, um, major uh, composer works that are very famous like Beethoven's Five, which you know almost everybody in the world seems to know. Um, so I do wonder whether... They missed a bit of a trick by changing the word classical to something else. And and this is part of the problem. Um, nobody knows what to call it. Do you call it orchestral? Well, the thing is then if you've got a string quartet, that's not really orchestral because that's chamber music. Or if you've got a piece of choral work, if you've got a choir, a beautiful piece by, I don't know, Eric Whitaker or Bob Chilcott. Well, that's not orchestral either because it's choral. And the word classical sort of encompasses everything within this brand. So I kind of feel one of the things we need 
is a new word. What that word is, I honestly don't know. I think one of the things that we need to look at doing and one of the things that can really turn around classical music is by reimagining how we attend concerts. I think the days of going to a concert where you've got white light on a stage, the musicians play a piece, they all walk off whilst the piano is brought on and the seating is rearranged, a piano concerto is played, they all walk off, the piano is taken away and, and the audience start talking to each other for seven or eight minutes and then the musicians walk back on and maybe an overture is played. I think the stage management part of that, I think the white light part of that, and I think the fact that they can be playing anything and as an audience member you have no idea what it is, I think is prehistoric and I think needs to change. There are some people changing this. Um, Raymond Gubbe are an interesting company. I work for them just for clarity's sake. Um, I'm not uh, contracted to them, so I don't have to speak nice about them. Um, but I work with them, and they pro- produce a, a concert called the Classical Extravaganza, uh, the Classical Spectacular, sorry. Um, and this is famous classical tunes, usually played by, uh, you know, the Royal Phil, um, quite often at the Royal Abbott Hall. And they have lights and lasers and cannons for the 1812 overture and and pyrotechnics and explosions. And it really is a big multimedia fest of classical music. I went to see this when I was really young and it's one of the things that inspired me uh, to continue pursuing classical music. I was thrilled and in awe of this concert. I still remember it to this day. And one day I would love to conduct the Classical Spectacular because I think the design of it, the idea and the concept of it is superb. There are many people in the classical world who will treat that style of content, uh, co- that style of concert in contempt. Um, and I think it's a great shame because I think if four, four and a half, five thousand people attend the Classical Spectacular and out of that, four or five hundred people may go to the South Bank to see the Philharmonia play. I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, There are other people around the world who are embracing new technology. Um, In 2016, the California Symphony uh, sought out a group of millennials who didn't know a lot or anything, in fact, about orchestras, and they asked them to attend a concert for a, a nominal price tag of about five dollars. Uh, They held the concert at a local brewery and at the end of the gig they all sat and ate pizza and drank beer and the orchestral members talked to the to the millennials uh, about their experience of the concert Um, and the whole idea was was taken from the Google research development project which was called Google X Um, and so they called it Project uh, Orchestra X and Almost every single piece of negative feedback was about something other than the performance. So it's about the idea of concert etiquette that they didn't like or uh, or not knowing about the music. But the music itself wasn't a form of negative feedback. Some of the comments that they uh, gave were the music was great. It's so impressive to see it in real person. Uh, The musicians are so good and it's weirdly cool to not have a focus on other things. Um, I think projects like this are really superb. Um, The California Symphony is selling 90%, uh, 97%, sorry, more tickets annually now than it was four years ago. Um, That's, you know, that's a big amount. And the first time... Uh, attendee uh, retention rate, so that's the the number of people coming back within a year to see a second show or more, has gone up from 13% to 27%. And, you know, they do common sense things like they send out a guide on email to everybody who's attending the concert way before the concert, and the guide is called Before You're Here. And it tells them about the music, it tells them what to expect, it tells them anything that they may not know. It's got an FAQ thing, what to dress, what to wear, when to turn up, 
how to behave and they're a very easygoing concert um, platform so they say if you want to clap clap you know you you won't be frowned upon here and I think this is a wonderful wonderful solution to try and break down the prehistoric um, attitudes of stuffiness in classical music the Chicago Sinfonietta are also doing similar things and they are really uh, reaching out to their local community in Chicago which is a very very diverse mixed community uh, and they do things like if they're going to perform the 1812 overture they have a, a marching band in full uniform come on stage and then they have cheerleaders um, appear in the choir stalls cheering on it's like a battle of the bands cheering on the two sides of of the marching bands to see who's going to win music is about experiencing emotion and if having some lighting on stage or if having a marching band come on, or if doing it in a brewery with pizza and beer, if any of those elements help emotion, help you feel something when you're sitting there and listening and watching this music, if any of these elements help that, why on earth would you not choose to do it? We're used to a multimedia world now, and when we watch TV, most of us have some sort of surround sound system at home um, and, and you're watching 4K and, you know, full colour and you go to the cinema and you've got surround sound system or you go to a Take That concert or a, or a Justin Bieber concert or a, I don't know, Michael Bublé concert or a Stormzy concert, whatever other type of music you listen to. And, and you see a big stage with lighting and big screens and pyrotechnics and things I wonder why it's not used so much today in classical music and, and why they haven't uh, tried to go down that route I personally love the idea that there are cameras dotted around an orchestra and a big screen behind an orchestra and when you're sitting there or watching these musicians pour their heart out and blood sweat and tears I love the idea that you on a screen can also watch a close-up of a violinist doing their thing or an oboe or a bassoon or a clarinet or a timpanist. I love that idea and the fact that you could then go home and re-watch the concert and maybe even choose your own camera angles. Yes, I know these things are expensive and money is a big issue, but I think investment needs to take place in classical music arts. Or alternatively, the classical music arts does really start to suffer. And one day, maybe, orchestras cannot afford to survive. You'd be amazed at how many orchestras are closing every year around the world because there isn't enough money. You have to pay 80 or 90 people to be on the stage, another 20 or 30 people backstage, the maintenance of a concert hall. All of that has to happen and yet you might be selling 500, 1,000, 1,200 tickets for a concert. The figures don't add up. The figures just simply don't add up. So this is a big issue and one of the reasons why the, the whole genre needs a new branding. It needs a new word, it needs a new face and it needs orchestras to come out of the world they're in. And not just turn around and say, we're going to perform contemporary music because that is the right, modern, cool thing to do. Because I hate to tell you, it's not. It's not the thing which will draw in new, young, fresh audiences. And of course, it all starts with music education. How on earth can my three-year-old Teddy go to a classical concert when he's 20, not knowing anything about orchestral or instruments. How, how can we expect him to be interested in that if he's not had an, an education which at least dips the toe into the water of the world of instrumental music? Music education in this country is a huge issue right now. We're, we're all aware of, aware of that. Unfortunately, there are more pressing things um, for the nation to, to deal with. So I totally understand why music education is not at the forefront of everybody's mind. But we are in danger. When I was young, I had what's called the musical blanket. That's what I call it anyway. I went to primary school. I had 
assemblies every day with live music. I had music classes two, three, four times a week. At the weekends, I went to have piano lessons and cello lessons and clarinet lessons. I sung in the local choir. There are local orchestras I performed in. I, I had a blanket of music when I was from about four years old. And that's one of the reasons why I became a musician is because I was wrapped up in this. And if we take music education away from our children, they don't have that blanket of music. They won't be wrapped up in it. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they won't be interested in live music when they grow older, unless it's a form of live music that they can put on. The piece lasts three and a half minutes and uses the four, same four chords, which is very catchy, and they get it immediately. So we can change the branding of classical music. We can make the music more accessible in the concert halls and add in lighting and, and, and add in camera technology and 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 you know oh my word what about the idea of a conductor or a soloist actually talking to an audience and explaining the state of mind the composer was in when he was writing something and talking about what the piece means to them i oh, know that would be an insanely stupid thing to do actually it's not um but we can do all of that but essentially if you don't give children music education <laughs> by the time they are 15 20 25 30 years old they're not going to have any interest in, in music from a, a classical point of view. And therefore, the whole genre will suffer massively. Now, I'm going to say something a bit, um, a bit naughty here, which a lot of people might disagree with. I went to, as I mentioned, a, a classical music conference called Classical Next. I loved it. I had such a great time there. I spent four days with like-minded people who are all passionate and love classical music as much as I do. Orchestras, choirs, soloists, performers, people who create concepts. Um, everybody from around the world, from a classical music point of view, um, gets together one time a year at the classical music, uh, at classical next. I really thought it was fantastic. They put on a lot of concerts and a lot of demonstrations and the thing that really disappointed me is whilst I was there I never ever ever saw a single piece of what I would call classical music I saw modern contemporary music played by a band where Everybody had their phone and could chip in with the sound world on by pressing buttons on their phone. Um, and live improvisation happened. I, I saw something in a, a nightclub where it was sort of slightly billed as classical, modern, contemporary DJ. And it just sounded like, well, nightclub music, which there's nothing wrong with that, but I wouldn't call it classical. I went to uh, the opening ceremony, um, which had a huge number of female um, composers and performers, and I congratulate them for that. I'm actually taking note of that. And it was all by uh, living uh, composers. And there's nothing wrong with living composers. But the idea of having a classical music conference without featuring any music from uh, the classical genre, for me, is a bit baffling. I, I have to admit, I was uh, very disappointed with that. Um, but that also shows you that I have a slight dislike for the word contemporary and for contemporary music. A lot of it is atonal. A lot of it is very difficult to listen to. A lot of it is not pleasing to the ear. And a lot of it, I feel, is written by composers who write it for themselves because they enjoy the writing process and they understand and they get something out of it. But it's not necessarily written with a listener's ear in mind. And that maybe is a bit of a controversial thing to, to say, and I'm sure I'll get a lot of um, living composers saying, how dare you say such a thing. But for me, music is about moving other people. I don't want to just move myself. I want to pass on my emotion and my feelings to an audience. 
And if the music is so atonal and so difficult to comprehend and listen to, and you really are challenged, I don't see that as a good thing. And I think it's not such a good thing for the art of instrumental music. There are exceptions. And I think if somebody said to me, who is going to be the person that we remember in 200 years, like we remember Beethoven and Bach and Brahms and Schubert, who who, who are the people who in the next 200 years we will remember? And my answer is, to be honest with you, not the people who are writing the eternal classical music. It's people like John Williams. John Williams affects us all. His music from Schindler's List, E.T., Harry Potter, God, the list goes on. You know, he will be remembered, I'm sure, in 200 years as a great composer. And I think we should celebrate orchestral music in films and TV. And I think we should bring it into the fold and into the genre. And I think it's a nice way to reinvigorate an audience. The Game of Thrones theme is so inventive and original. If it wasn't for the fact that it was on a TV series, that could easily be called classical music. Unfortunately, a lot of people who who see it because it's or who hear it because it's on a TV series go, well, that's not classical music. You know, that's a TV theme tune. Why does one have to be exclusive from the other? Because it's a wonderful piece of music. There's amazing music in games now for, for the youngsters. And there are some orchestras who are now starting to do gaming concerts and gaming albums. I think that's a seriously cool thing to do. But they need to get uh, the youngsters into the venues more. And then juxtapose that music, that gaming music, with um, other other music. Marla. Eric Whitaker. He's another example. Eric is a choral composer. And uh, many of you have probably not heard of Eric Whitaker, but he's an amazing guy, and he writes some of the most beautiful music. Um, I, I implore you to listen to the Eric Whitaker "This Marriage." I had that sung at my wedding, and it's one of the lasting memories I'll have for the rest of my life. And he did something called the Virtual Choir, which was singers record and upload their own videos from any location over the world. And all of the videos then synchronized and combined into one single performance to create the virtual choir. They've got 8,000 singers from the age of 4 to 87 from 120 countries. It was published on YouTube and it's now got over 40 million views. And that's a piece of choral music. There's a YouTube channel which has got a rendition of uh, Ravel's Bolero. So far it's got 7 million views. Um, There's a collection of Chopin uh, Nocturnes, 35 million views. And one of the uh, Beethoven Moonlight Sonatas, um, it's clocked up a staggering 114 million views. And it's still going up day in, day out. Classical music, is it dying? It's already dead. And that's a good thing. But now we need to find a way to rename classical music, rebrand it, think about it in a different way, bring in a new audience. Classical music has an awful lot more to compete with than it did when it started 300 years ago. Our world is frantic with things. The amount of times I walk down the street and bump into people because I'm on my phone or somebody else is on theirs, because we are all... Twittering, Facebooking, Instagramming, Snapchatting, whatever it may be. And I'm not going to judge them for that. I do that myself as well. And I enjoy it. But we must never forget there is an art to becoming a world class musician. People put their heart and their soul, their time, their energy, their life into it. 99% of them don't get massive financial reward for it. And they do it because it moves them and because they want to move others. So is classical music dead? Yeah, it's absolutely dead as a dodo. But that's a great thing. Because what will never die is people wanting to be moved by music. 
Thanks for listening.